Portland Road in terms of transportation corridors, and we could we could talk, and maybe at a future future conference we should talk about Fort Benton as as a, like a a wagon wheel center with spokes going out in every direction that had trails to some extent roads and you know all the way from Minnesota the road in the 1850s was being used to come overland above the north of the Missouri River and so on so I thought it was especially appropriate to us today to think about roads in other directions and no more colorful direction was there than the Hoopup Trail leading to, to Fort Hoopup. Gord will tell you all about that, but uh, let me tell you just about him. He's a, 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 a historian, a reenactor, and raconteur. Lives in Colgate, Alberta with his wife Rose and has been associated with Fort Hoopup National Historic Site. And I'm so glad that the director of Fort Hoopup Doran Dagenstein, if you'll stand, if you're, Doran, would you please stand? It's it's great to have for, Mr. Ford Hoopa with us. And uh, Gord has been a, a strong supporter and helper of Doran and Ford Hoopa for a number of years. Uh, actually, Doran's big project for a couple of years has resulted in the publication of Healy's West, The Life and Times of John J. Healy, and I share a great interest with Gord in this fascinating Healy character that had trading posts on the Sun River, really set up the Hoop Up Trail, set up Fort Hoop Up, and so on. But I think maybe Gord might mention Healy during his talk, so Once or twice. That's, uh, that's it except to say that the uh, Healy book is published in Canada, but it is distributed through Mountain Press, so you can get copies of that. And I've also got to put a plug in for a book I've got, and that is uh, a collection of Johnny Healy frontier sketches. This Healy character was of so many dimensions. He was a gifted storyteller and writer, and so while Gord has the the great biography of Healy. I have the great collection of Healy's stories. So with that, welcome, Gord Tolton. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, very much. And yes, uh, I greatly, uh, as much as I'm here to promote my own, I also would like to acknowledge Ken's life and death on the Upper Missouri because uh, Ken published some of the Healy writings that I really didn't think I could. Because Healy was a bit of an unvarnished character, and I guess the best way I can probably describe Healy is the way a uh, University of Calgary professor, Margaret Kennedy, said, John J. Healy has a problem with political correctness. <laughs> and after you learn about his, uh, his career, you'll, you'll kind of see why. He's kind of an unvarnished character, um, somewhat unknown on both sides. I, I guess I have to say a little bit about what Fort Whoop Up is. And some of us say whoop, we'll say, some of you say hoop. Uh, I'll address that a little bit later on. Uh, whoop Up is a great little place. It's one of the great treasures of Canadian Heritage Museums and I am extremely biased in saying that. So if you are in this area and uh, if you're ever headed up through our neck of the woods, we're only about a couple of hundred miles that way and just across the border, which some darn fool had to put a line through there about 1818. And I've been sorry about it ever since. Nobody asked me. Um, I, I strongly advise you come see us. Uh, one thing I kind of like to say is I teach at, at Whoop Up, we teach Whoop American history to Canadians and Canadian history to Americans. <laughs> it's a little bit of both. So, um, yes, and thank you for bringing up the hub of the wheel. Believe me, I had scribbled that note in this morning right here. So, I don't know, we're serendipity is really kicking in. Well, as, I'm going, as I say, I'm going to be talking about uh, Healy a lot because he is central to this story. That's the book, by the way. I'm back there signing at 6 o'clock, so, or any time you want to purchase. Uh, 
in the spring of 1864, Healy was not too far away from here, standing around down on the docks at uh, or the levee, as you may say, down at, uh, at Benton. Only he wasn't waiting for a steamboat. He himself had just gotten off of one. He was actually waiting for a wagon to come from the north. And he was waiting for a, uh, an expedition that he had sent to Fort Edmonton. Now that's much further north than Fort Whoop up at Lethbridge, Alberta is. It's at the modern city, the capital city of Edmonton, which is roughly about, uh, I'm converting my kilometers to miles here, about 500 miles from here. And uh, as gold expeditions, as we've been hearing about in Idaho and in Montana, which Teeley also uh, participated in, he had gone a little bit further north in 1863 and judged the Edmonton country uh, and the river in between as unexplored and unexploited as far as gold. He'd found a little dust. And he decided to go back to Fort Edmonton and to the Rocky Mountain House area uh, with an expedition in 18, the fall of 1863, but he didn't go himself. He went to New York City to do things like get married and have children and, and that sort of thing. And he had financed an expedition with some of the, the gold that he had found at Florence, Idaho, uh, which is uh, with, with the area that Keith was speaking of, not far from Pierce City. Uh, but uh, somehow along the way, as he was riding the steamboat back that spring, of 1864, he had gotten word that some of his comrades at Fort Edmonton had gotten into Dutch a little bit with the, the Hudson's Bay Company up there. And you have to realize at that point in time, we're about six years from being able to call that neck of the woods Canada. Canada was something way back east. That was Ontario, Quebec. Uh, the Hudson's Bay Company, um, by, by fiat of British Crown land holding and charters, owned uh, a huge swath of what is now Canada from Labrador in the east right to the Rocky Mountains in the west. And that was known as Rupert's Land. And they held it judiciously. They basically said, there's one business you have up here and that's Trappan de Beaver. You're doing anything else, get out. And that included gold prospectors, especially American gold prospectors, because we're holding this because the British are going to take it over someday. And uh, we don't want anything that's going to interfere with the beaver trade or even the buffalo trade or the, or the pemmican. So that's why the expedition got into trouble. They were basically run out of Edmund, Edmonton. I've been run out of Edmonton myself. It's not a good experience. <laughs> uh, now, one of the things, of course, as I said, he has put a lot of money into this. He pulled $20,000 out of the Idaho mines. And he has basically uh, put some of his and some of his father-in-law's money down on this. And he's, he's lost everything. And the first thing that happens is this little the Irish Yosemite Sam guy's down here and he goes, the affair put me on fire and I vowed that the minute I get $10,000 ahead, I would go back up into that country and make them abandon their fort if it was the last act of my life. Healy was going to drive the Hudson's Bay Company right out of Canada. <laughs> and he was a very ambitious man. He could, he could do it. Now about five years pass before this happens. Um, as we've heard earlier, these were trying times. The hot and cold running Blackfoot Wars were going on here in northern Montana, uh, culminating in the, the Baker Massacre at, uh, at some point. And uh, he also started the Sun River Trading Post. And that building is still here today, and um, uh, just passed away was recently was uh, Emma Toman who owned that house, and I've been in that house and been had the hospitality of uh, of her several times as she showed me when the bullet holes flew at a certain uh, event that happened that I'll be telling you about. Um, so Healy tried to find an edge. And indigenous trade required the raw nerve, self-reliance, and customer intelligence. So utilizing uh, not only the Métis half-breed offsprings of traders and native women, um, Healy learned the cultures of the, of the Blackfoot as trying to find a way of, of getting back into that country. In 1868, John McClellan leads two dozen men into the Old Man River, what they called in those days the, the Belly River country, 
um, as Benton was trying to finance their own little personal gold rush up there. Well, as we found out, the only gold you're going to find in southern Alberta is a several thousand feet down and black and sticky. But there's no shiny stuff in the creeks up in there. Well, believe me, I've tried. <laughs> uh, but Healy uh, was still convinced, and through his gold rush experiences and several experiences where he almost starved to death, he was not the kind of guy to let the metal rule the man. And he was not going to lead another rudderless expedition up into this Hudson's Bay Monopoly country unless he had a good reason to be there. And the good reasons were starting to come over across the border and he was starting to lure the robe trade of the Blackfoot, the Pagan, and the Bloods from going to Fort Benton and over to his own little trading post. Well, one day, on a warm March evening in 1869, the Bloods made the trek from the Belly River to the Healy store, erected a TV village of some 40 men, and in the night, um, there was an attack by some Ponderé and Flathead. And, uh, uh, to make the long story short, uh, several of the blood were killed. Uh, nobody in the Healy family or of his uh, trading employees were, were injured. But Healy himself credits uh, himself as uh, coming up the flank flyer barrage that drove the Ponderé off of the Sun River Bridge and off into the night. And what happened out of that was a um, uh, you know, you can imagine what the the, the uh, stereotype of the trader of those days. Um, okay, that was just another Indian fight outside the doors. You know, let them all die, and then we'll put them up in the end. Healy did not operate like that. He tended to the wounded of the blood. Um, to one, uh, a chief by the name of Many Braids, he brought him into his own kitchen floor and let him die on the floor and uh, promised him as he was dying, he says, I will take care of your son. And he had a 13-year-old boy by the name of Boitania, and that means flying chief. And he adopted that boy as his own, and that was Joe Healy, named after his brother, Joseph. And this says a lot about John Healy, and it's a lot about some of the intel intelligence that he's doing to get up into this expedition that's going to go north. Out of this, of course, there's still stolen horses. There's blood horses are gone, there's some of his horses are gone, uh, some that probably belonged to the U.S. government as he was also managing the, uh, the herd of the stock farm at that time. And uh, the Ponderay have come in and just hacked his corral gates to pieces and taken them out of there. So Petey, uh, Healy, along with a, uh, another reprobate by the name of John J. Kennedy, not John F. Kennedy, John J. Kennedy, <coughs> Uh, and another guy by the name of Keating, they ride to the Ponderay Reservation. And I look on the map and I'm like, oh wow, Sun River, you gotta go down to Helena, you gotta go all the way around the mountains, on up through the zoo. That's a long ways. That's quite a distance. And he's gonna walk onto the Flathead Reservation and tell them, I'm taking those stolen horses back. He got him. He went back, and the, the book and, and Ken's book all describe you know, what he went through. Uh, to get this, and why that never amounted to just three more dead white men in the middle of the mountains, I'll never know. But he got them back. He brought back all but, I believe, six head. He let the flatheads keep a few, and some had gotten lost on the way. So he of course put his own horses and the government's horses back in the corrals, and uh, the bloods that were still survivors, still camped on the land, and he goes, here's your stock back. Now I think we've all here in this room know enough about the fur trade to know that wealth is horses, and horses are wealth. We understand that. So for this guy to go all the way, that distance, his time, his expense, the risk of his life, to bring back somebody else's horses and give it back to them, there's one word, or there's two words I call that, brownie point. <laughs> He has gained the trust of the Bloods on that. So, uh, in this time, he has also gathered a uh, partner by the name of Alfred B. Hamilton, uh, who later would be uh, the ha Alf Hamilton from the, uh, the Shoto Agency, the old agency at uh, what is now the town of Shoto. And they decided to put together an expedition. 
Now, why does he go back into this Hudson's Bay monopoly country? Well, for one thing, in Blackfoot country, the Hudson's Bay really aren't there. The Blackfoot, for several generations, go, go either go north to Edmonton or they come south to Benton to the AFC, and it's just basically at their whim or where the herds are, because as Bob Dirk used to say, the buffalo just follow the next blade of grass. And, uh, and that's what happens. Now, bull's back fat, and uh, this would be the son of the bull's back fat that we've seen the, the Catlin pictures of from Fort Union. Um, he has made intimations in the last few years to Culbertson. In fact, Culbertson has been up in that territory trading from time to time that uh, we would like to see our trade store a little bit lo more local than it has been. Um, this is a this is like a 600, 700 mile treks that we're doing and, and if a trader happened to come up here we might talk about it. And you're not saying that in so many words and I don't really have a piece of paper that says that. But reading between the lines, um, Healy and Alf Hamilton plotted opportunity. Now what about the Hudson's Bay Company? Well guess what? They've decided to get out of the land business. Hmm. And they've been talking to some people in Ottawa. Now, what happens in between, there's a bit of a vacuum of a problem, because over in the Red River colony of what is today Manitoba, a man named Louis Riel has slightly objected to this, uh, this plot, and the government hasn't quite taken over. It's a bit of a vacuum, and I really believe that Healy was reading the papers and saw the opportunity and goes, well, while they're fighting over there, and while the Canadian troops are, are going over there, we'll go over here and thus is born the notion of going to whoop up. So, uh, for his stake, how does he do this? He doesn't want to just go up there and run some, some simple little trading camp or the back of a wagon. He needs backing, he needs a financier. Well, Thomas Power was a well-connected challenger to the, uh, the IG Baker Dominion here in Fort Benton. But uh, Tom Power had a problem. He had several thousand dollars uh, tied up in, uh, in trade goods, but he couldn't seem to get a trading permit because I.G. Baker was pulling the strings and uh, keeping him away from being able to have a trading permit with the territory to build posts wherever he wanted. He eventually would, but at this point, Power is about to go bankrupt. Well, on December 1st, 1869, there's a knock on the door. Hi, my name is John J. Healy. I hear you have trade goods. So Power thinks this is a pretty good idea. They sign some papers, make some loans, and um, a expedition is uh, secured. Now, there's a few people that had some objections to this. One was the U.S. government, uh, the U.S. Marshal. Um, wasn't happy about it. The uh, Indian superintendent for the Blackfeet Agency, uh, he didn't think that was a good idea because for Healy to go into that country, he's got to cross the reservation. And we all know he's going to cross with alcohol, which is verboten on the Blackfeet Reservation. And uh, it, well, U.S. Marshal William Wheeler says, power has been generally at the head or foot of most of the whiskey trade while the reputations of Healy and Hamilton does not leave a doubt as to what their intentions are on this matter. And uh, at one point, uh, the army steps in and they seize their caravans. Well, Healy's a Democrat, and th there's a term called whoop-up Democrats that you used to use around Fort Bend. And that seems to be the, the dominant uh, political uh, uh, force here in, in Montana. So he solicits some friends, and he manages to obtain from General Alfred Sully, the Superintendent of Indian Affairs, a handwritten permit that says, allowing travel and conveyance of alcohol across the reservation in exchange for a $10,000 peace bond. Through law men and, and competitors cried foul, Johnny and Alf packed their wagons, as December invoices indicate shipments to Sun River from Power Store. Healy maintained his liquor wasn't designed so much as a barter, much as a gift to, to tribal leaders to ensure loyalty. 
The Army at Fort Shaw challenged Sully's permit on the basis of the weasel words that Healy meant to cross the defined reservation. Now, with no way around the boundaries, you know, he's got this, this permit. One, one side of the government says go, the other side of the government you try will arrest you. You can tell that we're into a government situation here. Now, Healy's uh, notes that there's a military telegraph that's connecting Fort Shaw to the little contingent that's here, Fort Benton. So he formulates an ulterior plan, and this is, this is just genius, this just should be a movie, so if there's any producers in here, come talk to me. Um, quietly, he moves the wagons and teams from the Sun River Post into a hidden coulee, he, loading the wagons at night. Leaving Hamilton and Sun River, and all his own expedition, prepared to roll north at his signal. So Johnny gallops to Benton on a fast pony and he sends a fake telegram back to Hamilton, instructing his partner to meet him north of here on the Teton. This is a few miles away. The army, totally oblivious to where anybody is crossing anywhere, sends their troops out to the Teton. Meanwhile, he's headed out from Sun River. And uh, he, he not only has, uh, of course, deceit at his we as his weapon, he also has something else. Um, Pat Haney was an Irish uh, Civil War veteran who apparently was with him. And he says that there was a, uh, th that there was actually a party of Bloods that accompanied him. In other words, they were bringing a camp, they were bringing travois, and the indication was that there was a prearranged um, how should I say, prearranged arrangement, might as well just head out and say it, for the, the, the Bloods to actually travel with him, and this was sort of having in-house security. Mm. So not only so, so much against the army, but against other hostiles, other enemies, say the Sioux or the Pagan might have been around and had different ideas. Now another thing happens, when they get out to where, about where Shelby is, crossing the Marias out there in that, uh, that beautiful country that's white not because of snow, the Alkali Flats, um, they run into bull's back fat. And uh, now that they have left around December 27th, 1869, which should tell you that this is winter, mm -hmm. we're in Chinook country, and we often have open winters around here. So that, that it is an open winter tells you, you know, they're safe to go on wagons, they're not taking Santa's sleigh up there. And uh, so it's open enough that the game is probably up in the hills, and this is where bull's back fat gets caught with buffalo, deer, or anything else. And uh, by the time Johnny finds them, there's some trouble happening. So Johnny uh, sees that it's bull's back fat, knows his politics, opens the sheet, hands some flour, hands them some bacon, and said, travel with us until you run into the game. And I truly believe that where Bull's Back Flat led them was a true invitation after that. Brownie point number two. Mm. And uh, he has demonstrated to Bull's Back Fat that not only are there traders coming, and Bull's Back Fat can maybe counter, boy, do I have a location for you. So they cross the border, uh, the border that is, really isn't patrolled at that point in time, cross over the Milk River Ridge, and they descend into what is the forks of the St. Mary's, and what was then called the Belly, today the Old Man, just roughly uh, near where today where the Lethbridge Airport is today. And this was a place called Many Ghosts. And this, this goes back to 1837 and a smallpox epidemic that wiped through the flats. And uh, it has been considered both holy and haunted ever since. But this um, is, is proving to be a belly wintering, or, sorry, a blood wintering ground um, for the bloods uh, at this site. So why would you let these traders these guys with whiskey and everything else onto one of your most holiest sites because you want him there. Because as I said earlier, you're tired of going to Benton. You're tired of going to Edmonton. And uh, you found middle ground. 
Walmart has moved into your hometown. <laughs> now, Healy and Hamilton were out of touch during the, uh, as the Baker massacre uh, was unfolding, when it eventually it did get cold. Now, they were building a smaller fort that would be called Fort Hamilton. Um, Healy finally learned of the Baker Massacre when he made a, a quick uh, horse trot run back to Sun River at some point. And uh, he dismissed rumors that the Pagan were, were going to be out for blood after this and were going to be run anybody that was daring to be in, uh, across the line and into their territory. Healy dismissed the rumors. He says, no problem. And his exact words were, I have um, several, pro se several things ready for the Pagans if they decide to arrive, plus a larger bolus or two. What that means, well, because I'm one of the guys that fires the cannon from Fort Whoop Up from time to time, I believe it's the cannon that we fire from Whoop Up from time to time that he's talking about. So he has come into this, uh, this country prepared and prepared for security as well. Well, uh, true to form, as the, as the stockades and the buildings are going up one day, in comes the Pagan Cut Hand, enraged about the massacre. Arrived and asked to trade for powder and ball, which they promised to use to kill the new traders. So he, Healy's being asked to arm, arm his executioners here. Healy's very cool but cautious, his men slowly retreating into the incomplete cabins. Rifles and ammunition are distributed, with everyone assuming skirmish positions, determined to go down swinging. Well, the knock at the door, Healy cracks it open, but it's not cut hand, it's his friend, the blood, Bull's Back Fat. Bull's Back Fat also cites the Baker Massacre and the bitterness felt towards whites, but Back Fat recalled Healy's gesture of feeding his people. They were grateful, wishing to return the favor, and they're going to return the favor now. They cracked the open door a little bit further and saw the entire exterior outside the stockade filled with armed blood warriors stripped for battle. This is January. <laughs> In the distance were the Pegans civilly ready for a fight. And this is both bands within the Blackfoot Confederacy. Most times these are allies, you have to understand. But the alliances were not quite what they seemed. Bull's back fat friendship was not to be trifled with. If the Pagan wanted the deaths of Healy and Hamilton and company, they would have to go through the blood. <laughs> but Bull's back fat broke the tension, walked out to, uh, for a parley with Cut Hand, and said, if you want to trade, you trade. If you want to war, you'll war with us. So the Pagan lined up with their furs, accepting gunpowder and shot under Healy's varying terms. In other words, when the powder starts to run low, it becomes more expensive. He's a capitalist, first and foremost, you have to understand. But when it was time for Cut Hand to deal, Bull's Back Fat cautioned his counterpart, Art. He says, you have finished trading with these white men, now go and go peacefully. You have come, and kill, you have come to kill these white men, but if you come back with those intentions, you will have to kill me and my men first. Learning a very valuable lesson in fostering friendship and influence, the merchants had taken in, wait for this number, 1,600 buffalo robes that day. Trading on Blackfoot home turf was adventurous, but also very profitable. By the spring of 1870, Hamilton and Healy delivered their winter harvest back here to Main Street, or Front Street, sorry, to Fort Benton. George Howe, who was with him, recalled some 15,000 robes brought in. I don't know how many wagons that would have taken. Doran, can, he does, he's the banker, he does the math on that. But the Helena Herald reported gross receipts in excess of $50,000. 50,000 U.S. 1870 dollars. You can get your, your currency calculations out and figure out what that is. But it's probably the most money anybody has ever seen in this territory outside of the gold camps for a long time. So with that success, Johnny and Alf ambitiously planned a new structure on the same site, just yards from the first post. Brought in the carpenter, Will Gladstone, who they poached from the Hudson's Bay Company, to supervise construction in 1870. But the name of Fort Hamilton didn't stick to the second fort. It was Whoopa that divined the trade invasion. Now I'll, I'll just take a minute 
Uh, a few years ago, when we started this to go into uh, things like I.G. Baker's letters, I.G. Baker, when he spells whoop up, he spells it with an H. So it's whoop up. And I've noticed when Americans come up to our place, they say whoop up, we say whoop up. <laughs> I have tried to do that with educational programs with kids to get them to do it, and we just can't get our Canadian tongues around it. So <laughs> you say whoop up, we'll say whoop up, and we'll be to Scotland for you. Now, where does this strange name come from? We were asked that at the reception last night. I'll say it again so everybody can hear it. Uh, the phrase was a common usage. We've probably come up with a dozen explanations. As a whoop it up, a rowdy party behavior, and a slang associated with the bullwhackers of the freight wagons, who would call out, whoop it up, whoop it up, whoop it up, as the command for extra effort by the bulls. In fact, it's like stepping on the gas pedal and going up the hill. <laughs> More than a half dozen explanations claim the name, but the best that I like comes from George Houck's story because it's the best documented in that he actually wrote it down. Um, there was a, a German-American uh, from St. Louis by the name of John Y, and his, uh, his command of the English language was, was uh, imaginative at best. Uh, at some point, he came back to Benton, and someone asked him about the state of the affairs in the Northern Post, and Y replied, Ah, but it just depends on what I'm on the map. <laughs> what he was trying to say, but everybody likes to laugh at the foreigner, I guess. So whatever Y was trying to say in his fractured German English sent everybody into howls of laughter and took that to mean they were whooping up the whiskey trade with the Indians and making good money at it. All sorts of, uh, of uh, explanations we've found for it. So I hope that's satisfactory as a, as a time. And of course, that applies to the trail as well. Um, the new post of Whoop Up is about a 300 by 200 foot uh, grand affair, composed of artisan shops, stables, uh, manager's residence, common area bunkhouses, enfilade, storeroom, trade room, and two bastions. And uh, Gladstone assembled a crew of Métis, uh, many of them his relatives from the Edmonton area, and fell and hewed some 6,000 logs. And um, we still have a lot of discussions about exactly where those logs came from. Um, co cottonwood and poplar are the predominant uh, wood that you would see on the flats of the Old Man River at that point in time. And on the benchlands, you won't see anything. Um, so we don't know whether Gladstone might have gone up into the Porcupine Hills west of Fort McLeod and maybe floated some down. We have just never ever found a sample of wood that could be analyzed. So we can have all kinds of funs and fun and games with interpretation on these sorts of things. Uh, though fire damage, the older Fort uh, Hamilton remains active as a structure. In 1873, the Methodist uh, Reverend Jean McDougall from Eastern Canada described the post nearby as being operated by J.D. Weatherwax, who, who uh, Ken is very uh, familiar with, competing with Healy right on the back door in the former premises. And we know that that's a fur trade standard. Uh, rival trading posts used to operate uh, within the yards of each other. Uh, the establishment of Whoop Up also coincided with a massive, another massive smallpox outbreak in 1870, the third in 70 years, wiping out at that point in time 40% of the Blackfoot Confederacy's population with five months. Now there's folk tales that go around about faulting traders for spreading the disease, but those don't stand up to scrutiny and those folk tales go right back to the 1837. Um, smallpox virus. In fact, you can trace them back to the French and Indian Wars at Fort Pitt, way back east in Pennsylvania. So, you know, a lot of this is, uh, is things that get repeated over and over, but uh, there's still no denying that white civilization does introduce this bug. Now, the sale of whiskey tars are, are whoop up, period, but the variety of good was a complex inventory, axes, firearms, ammunition, traps, ropes, blankets, mirrors, pack saddles, knives, Matches, foodstuffs, and canned goods, and we even have one picture of a baby buggy. <laughs> now, Healy wasn't there for the short-term game. If you turn gain, if you ever come and see and, and see the structure as it lays out at Fort Whoop Up, this is not a this is not a move in and burn it down the next spring operation. He intends to be here, and a trader who respects his customers and the ground he is on gets along well. 
If they got treated badly, well, the reward was his own corpse on the prairie. Uh, the Sixaka chief, Crowfoot, had a simple rule. If you people are going to trade, you must be fair. Now, there's a ceremonial aspect as well, and it goes back uh, even to this, uh, this Pondere raid at Sun River. Hamilton Haley actually brokered a truce on the grounds of Fort Whoop Up between the South Pagan and the Pondere in the summer of 1871. They sat in on the beaches, on the speeches, passed the pipe, and at conclusion, Johnny invited the Pondere headman to his fort, keeping the camp separate until the jugs were dry. No doubt, more than a bit of trade was carried on. After all, when capitalism doesn't shut down because it's Sunday. Um, but this offer uh, offers insight into Healy and Hamilton's work, work, workings. Were they not respected, they would not only not allow to stay in business, but now so many varying bands see this fort as a common gathering place. And we've got Pondere, we've got Kootenay, there are stories that are coming down of, of, uh, of the Sioux coming in there. Uh, now who isn't welcome there is the Cree, and there's a very large battle near the site of Fort Loop Up. And in fact today, our uh, interpretive center is not actually on uh, its original pins, and there are geographic reasons because of that. But we are on the site of the, the, one of the last grand intertribal battles that ever happened anywhere in North America between the Blackfoot and the Cree that came out of South Saskat uh, the South Saskatchewan area, uh, following the rivers with the concept that they were going to basically drive the Blackfoot and, um, and, and gain, gain new buffalo hunting territory. The Blackfoot objected to the tune of several, leaving several hundred Cree died on the ground at what we now, is now still today called, politically incorrectly, Indian Battle Park, where our fort is. And we interpret that battle at that site. And we have several uh, um, uh, in, uh, models of interpretation there to, sh to show you that. Um, the Cree didn't stick around. And many of these ended up in the, back into Saskatchewan, uh, some of the Assiniboine back into southern Saskatchewan and some into what they call the Frog Lake area. And at least uh, one of the, uh, the Cree bands under uh, one called Big Bear was the same ones that were involved with the Northwest Rebellion in 1885 and later um, ended up down in the Fort Assiniboine area for the people who I was talking to from Chinook here earlier. Uh, <laughs> Now, earning trust occasionally took a show of force or foolhardy courage. And on one occasion, Johnny declined to sell liquor to the blood weasel head, who confronted Johnny with a six shooter and a long dagger, driving the blade into the countertop. A declaration of a fight. Well, Johnny's adrenaline just took over. He vaulted over the trade counter, grabbed weasel head by the ear, dragged him to the gate, and as he did, he pulled out his secret pocket derringer. Johnny's particular Derringer. Weasel Head was also going for his revolver, but Johnny brought the Derringer right down in his face as, Hamil as Alf Hamilton took the revolver and emptied the chambers. Weasel Her Head was thrown out of the fort, but all knew he would be back to challenge. Sure enough, two months later, Weasel Head is back, riding at the head of some 60 warriors stripped for battle. He faced the fort's gaze with a muzzleloader across the horse, uh, and his forearms raised straight up. He's calling Johnny out. Unarmed, and this is a thing in, in Johnny's life. He's a gunfighter that often walks around unarmed. Johnny walks out, predicting Weasel Head's play. He would ask to shake hands, then the weapon would be drawn. But to make an honorable killing, Weasel Head had to touch his enemy first. So as he reached to accept the handshake, he fooled him. He pulled the opponent right off the horse and grabbed the rifle just as Weasel Head hit the ground. Healy laughed but gave him his life back. He says he helped his would-be killer to his feet and invited him to come in and feast. Weasel had not only accepted but stayed to trade. Ballsy act, but a positive impact. And his cachet was raised in the estimate of the Bloods. Adopting Poitania, or Joe Healy, had made him a relative. Aiding Bull's back fat showed generosity. The mercy shown Weasel had gained him acceptance into the Black Elk Society and he was given the name of, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced this, Akapakini, or Cut Nose. An oral history relates Healy accepted another gift, lavishing 
um, to the political chief of the Black Elks, and he also received the daughter of many spotted horses, which was a marriage that he never... He also purchased horses, and uh, I think we're just finally kind of getting a handle on, on how this happens. Um, he was buying horses for the ranching industry of Montana, paying one to three dollars a head equivalent to the blood, and he would take them and of course bring them back south and make 20 to about twenty dollars per head, six to ten times his investment. Uh, let's see, where am I go? Went past that already. Now this is not the tale of a single fort. Though there was a border divided the country, the landscape and the players remained the same. The whoop up tribe tramp sparked a market that revived the more abundant economy of Fort Benton, IG Baker, TC Power, and many of the Wetzel and Weatherwax, and many of the prominent Benton merchants. And uh, the Baker Company's uh, operations were controlled by the very ambitious Conrad brothers, who were quick to jump in to catch up to their crosstown rival, Power. So the name whoop up of the fort becomes applied to a regional description, a duchy untouchable by law. Now, here's a name that your Mullen Rotophiles are going to love, Charles Shaft. You wondered where he was? This is where he was. An amputee lost his legs to frostbite, and I have it right on her, on the Mullen Road, sought sanctuary from his legal troubles at the place whose reputation stirred the imagination, it's his own words now, Stirred the imagination to picture red-handed desperados performing bloody deeds and defying the laws of civilization. Now, I'm still getting into Shaft, but uh, the, cu the cusp of what I'm getting at is he has been the record keeper at some mission along the Mullen Road, and apparently some funds from the mission had absconded, and somebody wondered whether he was absconded with the funds. And before he could be chatted to about that, apparently he caught a wagon for whoop-up. <laughs> there was no denying the cha uh, changes. Um, the trade brought increased pressure on the buffalo with their robes commodified or commoditized. The herds were pursued with greater vigor. Trade liquor did cause death from overexposure, indulgence, and heightened violence, but still, a smart trader doesn't knowingly distribute poison to a warrior class that can wipe him from the earth at will. That Healy remained in business for six years suggests a lot more regard to me for his customers. Others held less esteem, uh, like wagon traders or other competitors who would toss up a rickety shack for a one-time haul of furs. And uh, we have all kinds of other names that, uh, that kind of emulate the whoop-up name, and monikers like Slide Out, Slew Bottom, Robber's Roost, Fort Kip, Spitzy Post, and Standoff. Wagon traders were sub-dealers who were staked by the Ford operator for the cost of trade goods, roaming from camp to camp camp to camp, so it's just like a traveling salesman, only the uh, operator at the fort is grub staking them. Uh, one trader, George Hammond, grossed a tidy $2,800 in the June of 1872. Now that gave uh, Healy employees a chance to work on a percentage basis, and at least 15 wagon traders that I could count uh, on were on the complicated books that Healy and Power kept between themselves. The risk was in the trader returning with the hides without getting killed or driving away with the ropes. Uh, okay. Profits didn't always translate into strong cash flow for Healy and Hamilton because Healy's uh, servicing a, I'm sorry Power family, he's servicing some very high debt um, to TC Power. He might still owe you money. <laughs> uh, paying freighters and depending on honesty kind of ate up the margins. As long as the robes kept rolling in, TC Powers uh, tolerated some deficiencies, but uh, TC had his own bankers to pay down and began to get nervous about the capital he had invested in no man's land, especially when Healy balked at the interest rates that were being paid, and had a mortgage held on Healy's teams and probably on the Ford itself, for all we know. Um, when Power insisted on an inventory in the spring of 1872, and after cashing in his crop for that year and taking a look at the inventory, Healy had still had $2,400 outstanding on their notes. So he has basically spent all of 1872 and still owing money. It's kind of like me at tax time. Uh, 
But the placement of Wupa was also sound, but Buffalo Roam, if herds moved, traders uh, could remove out of their range. But this was also caused something else that was happening. Um, Fort Edmonton, now remember the $10,000 I will drive the Hudson's Bay right out of their company, country? Well, he didn't drive them out of their country, but uh, the HBC at Fort Edmonton and Rocky Mountain House depended on pemmican and they depended on the pemmican bags coming north, and, and probably so did Benton as well, but Benton at least was getting them from Healy. And Healy would take in all the pemmican he could. Sometimes he'd turn around and he'd hand it back after trade. Sometimes he'd give it away in feasts. Sometimes he'd go and throw it out in the river just to get rid of it, anything, but to keep it from going north. And this was kind of using uh, food as a weapon, sort of a, a, a gimmick he'd learned back in the uh, in his boyhood in Ireland during the famine. So uh, yes, he was angering the Hudson's Bay Company. And at some point, the Hudson's Bay Company, there was going to be recompense. Now, somebody else seems to want uh, uh, their, their money out of this area, and that's the Wolfers. And in August of 1873, just as the Canadian government is kind of getting a hold of uh, maybe we should be do some, something about what's happening out in this territory, the Cypress Hills Massacre occurs uh, near where Fort Walsh is today on Canadian territory. And when uh, there's about 20 Assiniboine are killed, and when the Wolfers under Tom Hardwick come back to Fort Benton bragging and start trading in scalps for drinks and things like that, and uh, newspapers are writing out, the 13 Kit Carsons have arrived from their grand victory. Well, if you read into the Cypress Hills Massacre, it wasn't a victory, it was shooting fish in a barrel. And uh, there was one person that was not amused, and that was uh, one of the Indian agents on the, the, the Assiniboine side, on the U.S. side. And, uh, of course, we all know the channels of government move slow, and when you're talking international relations into the, the Dominion, of course, uh, the Indian agent has to speak to Washington. Washington can't speak to Ottawa in those days because Ottawa doesn't have any international rights to its own diplomacy. They have to speak to London, and London has to speak to the colonial office, and summer vacations happen. And the next thing you know, uh, the news does hit Ottawa, which really angers uh, the Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, <laughs> and seems to anger all of Ontario and uh, Eastern Canada. Now, I don't really believe that Eastern Canada gave a, a rat's petunia about these 20 Assiniboines, but they did care about sovereignty on what was deemed Canadian soil, even though at this point in time there wasn't even so much as a border guard or a postal clerk to tell anybody who was breaking the law. How are we doing for time? Oh, that's not bad. So, uh, between what the Hudson's Bay is telling Ottawa and between what uh, is, is getting to them in other ways, also through some of the ministers like the Reverend McDougall, we get the Northwest Mounted Police. And uh, we also have a showdown that Healy has with uh, Charlie and Conrad through a proxy. Uh, some of the Wolfers form a protective organization that they call the Spitzy Cavalry. And essentially, just, just to make it really quick, the Spitzy Cavalry is kind of a, a protection racket. And they are offering protection to the forts as long as they go out of the business of selling rifles to the Blackfoot. And also, um, you can sign this contract that would you please buy all of your goods from the IG Baker Company. Well, Healy uh, uh, met the Spitzy Cavalry in the fort one night. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, he threatened to blow a cannon on all of these, on the on 18 men, including himself, inside the fort. He was going to do an Alexander Harvey suicide run. And uh, as soon as Spitzy Cavalry learned what was happening, that was the end of the Spitzy Cavalry. They decided not to be hired goons for Charlie Conrad anymore. Um, one thing I just wanted to say, and we have often understood that the connection with the Missouri River as the primary Canadian supplier. And while I still believe that to be very significant uh, to what percentages we don't yet know, uh, 
um, with our area, we, we can rely that any good that could get to St. Louis or other railhead points on the Missouri um, had the possibility of getting to Wupa, whether it be a baby carriage or gunpowder or a stand-up piano. But uh, some of our recent research that Dorla and myself were doing some reading over the winter until winter ended, um, we opened our minds to the possibility of whoop up and the, uh, the whole Benton area also being supplied from the west via the Columbia River and what we're talking about all day today, the Mullen Trail via the Pacific Connection. And they knew of these supply lines and of course we've got Charles Shaft, you know, he's got that experience. So. Um, it's also ex suggests to me the possibility of supplies coming north from the Union Pacific Railhead at Corrine, Utah um, and completed in May of 1868. The Montana Trail from Corrine supply supplied Helena, Bannock and other gold camps and extended to Sun River. Though that trail from Utah was mountainous and tough, it could provide an alternative to the Missouri route as uh, the river sometimes had problematic low, low periods. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably skip past the Northwest Mountain Police and leave that for uh, any sessions that you want to have later on or any of the questions. But eventually, um, Healy is actually kind of confiscated out of the business. Not so much confiscated, but frozen out. Uh, by the time the Mountain Police arrive, what is also happening is yes, they exert a measure of control over the whiskey trade, but the amount of police are also cut off from their supply lines from Winnipeg. It's a long ways over there. There's no river, there's no railroads, there's no really good overhead roads. The best road to supply them is from here. So all of a sudden, we have this, uh, this situation of the Canadian government that complained about the Americans, needs the Americans, to supply their goods, their beans, their bacon, uh, to contract for their own posts. And also we have Treaty Number no. 7 with the Blackfoot Confederacy being signed on, uh, uh, in 1877. So we have uh, needs for Canadian government uh, to supply the Confederacy. And that carries on. And this is really where Power and Baker's star takes off. Uh, they become millionaires off of that Canadian government procurement. But what really happens here is that little timers like Johnny Healy and Joe Kip, he, Power and Baker do not want anybody spoiling the party. And by 1876, uh, Power and Baker are, are doing everything they can to freeze their, their one last competitor, Healy, right out of business. And by, by that point in time, even with a mounted police post right inside his fort, Johnny can't compete. He's losing money left over right, he's bleeding money. And uh, his $25,000 post, suddenly he has to sell it to one of his employees, Dave Akers, for $4,500. Mm -hmm. He goes home. And um, to find out the rest of Johnny Healy's career, you're going to have to buy the book. <laughs> But I will just, uh, if you'll just allow me one thing, how, I'm a bit prejudiced, but the view to me is oversimplified and misinformed about whoop up. Um, if Bloods and Pagans didn't want traitors in their territory, they would have been expelled without a thought and, and it would have been done with. The likes of Healy were not only accepted, the Benton trade was invited, a simple case of customers who wanted it, got tired of traveling long distances. How did the customers feel about it? One of the most important recollections we have on record is Rosie Davis, a blood woman who died in 1983. I said 1983. Who as a little girl recalled it as a place of uh, where her people gambled, race horses, brought in their crops of furs, and was angry whenever she read about negative portrayals of the fort. Uh, she saw a place where traders brought wonders from beyond the prairies, brightly colored cloth, beads and jingles, and things, many of goods that enhanced their lives. So trade is a two-way street, and the always adaptable Blackfoot saw new technologies, fashions, and ways of life. History is a progression of the timeline, not a status quo, and it's pure human nature to be curious about the new thing, whether it's an invention or so something you've never seen until a trading post appears or the new country that the trader himself comes to visit.
That in the end is the essence of contact that brings us to where we are today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. I'm sorry. Okay. I'll be around all night for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. So after Healy was frozen out in 1876, what did he do? He came back to Fort Benton with others, started the Benton Record, the first newspaper in northern Montana, and wrote a series of uh, overall maybe 50 frontier sketches that are in my book. So, but then he uh, also dabbled in another occupation by 1878, I believe. He was the sheriff of Shoto County, which of course at that point was the county that extended from the Rockies to the Little Rockies, from the Judith to the Medicine Line. So that monster county, Healy was the sheriff. Um, I thank Gord so much and, and our shared history, regional history with the Canadians uh, causes us to have uh, constant interaction and, and it's great to uh, have a chance to share some of that uh, northern focus trade and, and that uh, fascinating hoop, hoop up trail with, uh, with you all. But now let's turn to, uh, to the 1855 cre treaty that uh, maybe made the Mullen Road um, possible. Um, that we're delighted to have Dr. Sally Thompson with us. Uh, she's an anthropologist, ethno-historian, filmmaker, independent research collaborator, and an exhausting set of other occupations. Uh, she's worked for over 30 years with native people on both sides of the Rocky Mountains, and uh, it's just a thrill to have Sally with us today. Thank you. Thank you. 